1924, on the outskirts of Mount St. Helens in Washington State, five men in a, in a remote cabin encounter something indescribable. They are attacked throughout the night by what they refer to as mountain devils. You're listening to the Mysterious Brews podcast, and tonight we bring you the Ape Canyon Incident. Welcome to a deep, dark, dank, moist basement somewhere in the bowels of Georgia. Well, we uh, have barely figured out how to do this. It's taken, what, seven, eight days? Something like that. But uh, we have some new patrons to give For real? For realio. That's what I'm talking about, man. Christmas coming early. Jesse Halderson. Good name. Good, strong Christian name. A man named Rob West. (gasps) I know him. Yep. Dean Knighton and Andrew Ocampo. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. So we should be rich by now, right? Yeah, you've lost your mind. We lost so many. We lost so many during the Christmas season because they, they ain't got the money. Oh, so we've lost patrons? Yeah, we lost them. There was some that said that they just didn't have the money right now, and so I tried to hint around that it was only $12 a year, so hopefully they come back. Well, look, I mean, if we're not worth sacrificing the love and appreciation of your family, what are we even doing this for? I know, man. If we can't get 12 bucks a year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on! I paid, I paid Netflix like seventeen bucks a month, and I barely watched the shit. <laughs> well, let's uh, kick it off, ladies and gentlemen. So, like Coach alluded to in the opening, on a warm July day in 1924, five miners working the hillside of Mount, Mount Saint Helens and the Lewis River area in southwest Washington State stumbled upon something strange. Yeah, I would say that. An encounter Strange would be a good way to put it. Yeah, you're right. An encounter with tall human-like eight men that stalked the miners. Communicating with chest thumps and an eerie whistling, the eight men had been observing the miners for a few days without anyone in the party being wiser. It was only when one of the miners spotted one of the creatures and fired a shot did they make themselves be seen. You know, because shooting at people usually... Or anything. Shooting at anything's more than likely going to piss them off. Well, yeah, but during my research, I got very two very conflicting stories. One I don't believe, and the one I don't believe, it said that the guy shot him, shot a Sasquatch twice, and it stumbled backwards and fell off a 400-foot cliff. Yeah, I read that one, too. So, yeah. There's I don't a, know. I don't there, know if I buy that. There's a little uh, conjecture being uh, maybe some... What do you say? Fluffing of the story? We're telling fish tales, I think. Well, it ain't on their Wikipedia page, so clearly. Clearly it's not true. Yeah. So the incident on Ape Canyon was to be one of the earliest, best documented Sasquatch encounters in modern history. One of them Sam squashes. Sam squanch. So Fred Beck was one of the five miners that hiked up the mountains on a warm July day. According to him, the day started off like any other day prospecting. The men were up at dawn and usually worked until the sun began to set. Beck and the other miners working on a gold claim they had made, which they called the Vander White. They had been prospecting in the area for six years, and on this particular day, one of the men came across a set of odd footprints on a sandbar that at first looked human, but as he got closer, he found that they measured 19 inches in length and were anything but human. That's big. Yeah, that's just a, that's a large human. Disturbed by the finding, what is known among the tale of this incident, they call this man Hank, which is not his true identity. But Hank ran back to the camp to inform the others of what he had found. He told the others that he had found the tracks on the sandbar in the middle of a small creek, and the men decided 
that they wanted to go back and look at it. Now, this creek is where they had used, I guess, the upstream to uh, get their water, and downstream they would bathe in it. So hopefully they kept those separate. The men followed Hank back to the river and found the tracks still there. They described the tracks to being, just like he said, 19 inches long, but they were four inches deep in the sand. However, upon inspection of the area, the men noticed that there were only two footprints in the sand, and they were in the middle of the sandbar, as if whatever had made those prints had a huge 160-foot step onto the middle of the bank. A what? 160-foot step. I don't, what is that, like 50 yards, something like that? I don't think that's possible. Yeah, that's 55. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Hank stated, quote, no human being could have made these tracks, and there's only one way they could be made. Something dropped from the sky and went back up, end quote. Oh, God, so now we're getting into the whole alien Bigfoot crap? Uh, that's all he ever says about it. I guess that's the no, way he was, could explain it. It was in a tree. Exactly. He just swung out on a vine like Tarzan. Now, the men yeah. were under the impression that whatever large creature made the prints, it seemed to have appeared and disappeared into thin air. A couple of days would pass from finding the footprints, and the group began to hear strange sounds in the wilderness, loud thumping sounds that echoed through the forest as if someone or something was beating its chest. Now these this is exactly why I don't ever camp. Go camp. Yeah, yeah. You're not gonna find me Other out there. Other than that, the last time I went, I got poison ivy on my bunghole, but that's a different story. Yeah. Well, that's probably for our uh, bunghole podcast. <laughs> now these sounds were followed by a loud shrilling, whistling noise that made the seasoned miners unnerved, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> They described the whistling as being all around them, coming from one ridge not too far away, only to be answered by another whistle from a different ridge, an obvious two-way communication that the men became aware of. Hank asked Fred to come with him to refill the men's canteens at a spring nearby. As the two approached the spring, Hank yelled out and pointed his rifle into the distant trees. That's when Fred saw a tall, hairy creature by some trees. It stood next to a pine tree about 100 yards from them on the opposite side of a small canyon. According to Hank and Fred, the creature quickly dodged behind a pine tree, poking its head out from side to side from time to time. Fred recalls the incident as follows, quote, We walked to the spring, and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle, and at that instant I saw it. It was a hairy creature, and he was about 100 yards away on the other side of a little canyon standing by a pine tree. It dodged behind the tree and poked its head out from the side of the tree. At the same time, Hank shot. I could see the bark fly from the tree from each of, the, of his three shots. Someone may say that that was quite a distance to see bark fly, but I saw it. The creature I judged to have been about seven feet tall with blackish brown hair. It appeared from our view for a short time, but then we saw it running fast and upright about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot three times before it disappeared from view, end quote. So these these boys, uh, I guess, don't think it's too human if they're just cracking off shots left and right. Well, I mean, come on. You don't just take random shots in the woods? Not usually. Oh. Well, <laughs> I guess not, you're better than me. That's not the kind of hunting you do? No. I just try my, you know... I just go for it. You just go full chalant. Wildlife be damned. I'm, sh I'm shooting shots. <laughs> <laughs> the two men quickly made their way back to their camp and told the others of their encounter. All of the men agreed that the incident, along with the footprints, was enough to convince them to pack their shit up and head home. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think I would have done the same damn thing, and I would never, ever, 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 ever come back. Ever. Ever. They were set to leave the following morning since the sun had already began to set. In hindsight, if they only knew what awaited them that night, they probably would have left the mountains as soon as possible. The miners' camp included a few small tents and a pine log cabin that had been built by the miners just a few months earlier. It wasn't much, but the cabin offered the men shelter from the weather and the elements. 
That evening, the men sat around the fire smoking their pipes and discussing their plan to leave in the morning. As the night air grew cold and the darkness seemed to turn an inky black, they decided to turn in and get some much-needed rest. Not long after they had extinguished their lanterns, a loud wall-shaking thud made them jump to their feet. Something had hit the side of the cabin hard enough to knock loose the chinking in between the locks. Now, if you don't know what that there chinking is, that's that white stuff in between the logs of a cabin. Oh, I thought you were just being racist. No. Allowing them a good peek outside their cabin, they heard footsteps and unusual grunting noises. Through the holes, Hank managed to catch a glimpse of what was making the horrific sounds. Hank would later recall that he only managed to see three of them. But given the amount of noise and commotion, the men believed that there were more than three ape men type creatures outside the cabin. Well, three's, three's enough for me. I mean, to be honest uh, with you, one's enough. Yeah, I don't need more. No. Boom. Three's the max. Yep. Boom, another hit, rock hit the wall. Boom, boom, a few more. Hank then pointed his rifle through the opening in between the logs of the cabin and shot into the darkness. There was not a sound to be heard after the shot. The woods fell silent. The footsteps stopped as did the rock throwing. Hank fires another shot, still nothing but more silence. Thinking they had scared whatever was out there away, the men took a deep breath. Now, this was just a small reprieve because the silence was broken by yet another rock hitting the roof of the cabin with an unbelievable force. At this point, the cabin was then besieged by rocks pelting off the walls and sometimes falling through the chimney of the fireplace as well as loud booms against the walls as the creatures struck the logs and the air was filled with the, what sounded like footsteps of the creatures running around on the roof. The men began firing their rifles directly through the door and ceiling and Fred says of the attack. Now, this is a long one, so bear with us. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Quote, the only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we would quit shooting. I told the rest of the party that maybe if they saw we were only shooting when they attacked, they might realize we were only defending ourselves. We could have had clear shots at them through the opening left by the chinking had we chosen to shoot. We did shoot. However, when they climbed on, up on our roof, we shot round after round through the roof. We had to brace the huge log door with a long pole taken from the bunk bed. The creatures were pushing against it, and the whole door vibrated from the impact. We responded by firing many more rounds through the door. They pushed against the walls of the cabin as if trying to push the cabin over, but this was pretty much an impossibility. As previously stated, the cabin was, stirred, was sturdy, Hank and I did most of the shooting. The rest of the party crowded to the far end of the cabin, guns in their hands. One had a pistol, which still is in my family's possession. The others clutched their rifles. They seemed stunned and incredulous. The attack continued for the remainder of the night with only short intervals in between. A most profound and frightening experience occurred when one of the creatures being close to the cabin reached an arm through the chinking space and seized one of our axes by the handle. Before the thing could pull the axe out, I swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it caught on the logs, and at the same time, Hank shot, barely missing my hand. The creature let go, and I pulled the handle back in and put the axe in a safe place, end quote. So not only are they attacking, being shot at, but they're like, you know, caution to the wind, I'm going to stick my arm in here and grab an axe, we're going to end this. So it was not until daylight began to creep through the cracks of the cabin that the attack stopped and the forest returned to silence. It seemed as if the creatures not yet known as Bigfoot and which the miners called, quote, mountain devils were gone. They cautiously exited the cabin to check out the area. They looked around and saw rocks strewn all around the cabin and signs of the attack the previous night, like footprints, but no signs of the creatures themselves. This is until just mere moments later, Fred looked up by the bordering ridge and saw one of the creatures. It was standing there about 80 yards away looking down at the men. Fred raised his Winchester 3030 once more, took his time to aim, and shot three times, hitting the creature several times, and they all watched it topple over the cliff down into the gorge 140 feet below. 
The men then left in a hurry, leaving all their equipment behind in the process. Fred will describe in more detail what the creatures looked like. Quote, they are about seven feet tall, but they are larger ones. They had large ears and a head that was in proportion with their large muscular body. Their shoulders were tremendous, but they had musculature. But they had slim <laughs> hips. They wasn't childbirthing hips. They just slim had slim hips. That's what he said. There ain't no way. They were hairy but not shaggy. In general, they possess a very stout physical frame, but looked more like a giant human than an ape. End quote. Once the men had seen the creatures fall or the creature fall off the cliff, they decided to make a run for it, leaving their equipment and belongings behind, like I previously stated. They took what they had in their hands and on their backs and made the hike back to Hank's Ford pickup truck. Post haste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> Which was parked miles away from the camp and Ape Canyon. The attack left the men shaking and confused as to what they had come across. What were these creatures? Had they managed to actually kill one of them? The men eventually made it back home to Kelso, Washington, where they all agreed not to tell what had happened to anyone. But, according to Fred, Hank soon started talking to people, and before long, the story was hitting the news. This would begin what Frank calls the Great Harry Ape Hunt of 1924. Do you really have to add Harry into that? Well, that's what he called it. Tell I mean, without saying. If you say apes. ape, I mean, I'm going to get Harry in there. <laughs> According to Frank, they were all relentlessly harassed by reporters. Reporters came from Portland, Oregon, and Seattle. They all paid the men a visit wanting to know every last bit of detailed information that had happened during the supposed attack. People began flocking to the area where their claim was located, armed to the teeth with guns in order to hunt down the, quote, mountain devils, including a big game hunter from England. There were so many trigger-happy people out in the woods that law enforcement officers and rangers were sent in to disperse them before someone got hurt. As the weeks passed and the reporters spread, Fred found himself going back to the mountain in search of evidence. He took with him two reporters and a detective from Portland. Retracing the steps he and the others had taken, Fred managed to find the creature's tracks near the campsite. Much to the reporter's amazement, they managed to photograph the tracks to add credence to the men's story. Fred would find the cabin in shambles as if it had been ransacked, but no sign of blood or the body that he claimed should have been at the bottom of the canyon was able were able to be found. The bizarre account earned the area the name Ape Canyon, and over the years, Fred's story has been told and retold with many flourishes, embellishments, of which he would say years later, quote, so much has been written in Washington and Oregon papers throughout the years. Most accounts tell of giant boulders being hurled against the cabin, and some say even fell through the roof, but this was not quite the case. There were a few large rocks around in that area. It is true that many smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they did not break through the roof, but hit with a bang and rolled off. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state I was hit in the head by a rock and knocked unconscious. That's just not true. End quote. Well, that's good. Sounds to me like they were just practicing their basketball skills. They were shooting rocks at the at the chimney. Yep they know. had they had a they had a match with the Globetrotters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, about forty three years later, Fred decides to write a book. In nineteen sixty seven, he released his book titled "Quote: I Fought the Ape Men of Mount St. Helens, Washington." End quote. A not-so-catchy name for the small five-chapter book that goes a little beyond the encounter. However, it's in the book that we learn a little bit more about Fred Beck and his claims of clairvoyance and his special abilities that led him and the others to Ape Canyon. Now, roll up your britches legs, boys and girls, because this is going to get interesting. <laughs> in his book, Fred claims that since he was a young boy, he had the ability to see spirits and have premonitions. He goes on to say, okay, I'm out. 
He go. Oh, it gets better. He goes. No, out. I'm out. You had me at Bigfoot, but I can't do this. He goes on to say that two years before the Ape Canyon incident, they found a mine with the help of a spiritual being. A large Native American figure dressed in buckskin appeared to the men and told them that if they followed a large white arrow, it would lead the men to the mine. Fred claims that he and other members of the mining party could see the actual image of an arrow floating in free space, pointing the way to the location of the mine. Right. I know this. I just, I, I like picture like those big white arrows on Google Maps, and you can actually see it. Yeah. <laughs> I wish this Native American clairvoyant would come visit me and point me to the right lotto tickets. Yeah. Or another mine. No, hell no, I don't want to do manual labor. Oh, well, okay. I ain't digging for that shit. <laughs> I just want to hand it to me. <clears throat> hand me one of them big ass checks. In I'll his... take it to a big ass bank and get me some big ass cash. Well, that's right. In his book, Fred claims that, quote, we all saw the arrow soar up high, change direction, and swoop down. We had to follow in the general direction before we could find it again. It hovered near the top of the north cliff of Ape Canyon. That was the site where we later blasted out our shaft. We got a little closer, and we all saw the image of a large door open, and the big Indian appeared in front of it. He spoke, because you have cursed the spirit leading you, you will be shown where there is gold, but it is not given to you. With those words, he disappeared. Then we saw the door slowly close. There was a huge lock and latch, but as the door shut, the lock did not latch. A closed door, but it was not locked. We just as well packed up and go home, one of the party said, and that is just the way our gold mine turned out. Closed, but not locked. We worked that mine for two years, and one, say, showed well over $2,000 a ton, but it turned out what we actually had done was to cut the leaders. There's a pocket of gold in the that cliff if someone is fortunate enough to find it we gave up looking for it end quote so somehow they pissed what we're doing next weekend <laughs> somehow he pissed off his clairvoyant indian and native american native american and did not that, that guy did not show him the pocket of gold i hate when that happens yeah i absolutely hate it all right, he goes on to say that the whistling and chest-thumping sounds they reported hearing had been plaguing them for a week or so before the encounter. The noises were always following them, but were subtle, not as loud as they once were when the attack began. Fred's reasoning behind this is that the creatures were not fully there. In other words, they hadn't fully manifested, therefore they sounded muffled. He and the others believed that the creatures were always present and followed them throughout, but had not appeared to them in physical form. This made them believe that the strange footprints they found in the sandbar had an, an otherworldly explanation. The creature that made those prints manifested out of thin air. Of course, this wasn't something that the men told the media or anyone else, but since it would only add to the already incredulous story they had... Fred decides to continue and says, quote, the abominable snowmen are from a lower plane. When the condition and vibration is at a certain frequency, they can easily for a time appear in a very solid body. They are not animal spirits, but also lack the intelligence of a human consciousness. When reading of evolution, we may have read many times conjecture about the missing link between man and the anthropoid ape the snowmen are a missing link in consciousness neither animal nor human they are very close to our dimension and yet a part of a lower one could they be the missing link man has been so long searching for the human soul once dwelled in a spiritual body and eventually incarnated at the fall of man into bodies like we have now the beings we call abominable snowmen were not of necessarily high development to incarnate in human form. They had not reached that scale of spiritual evolution. They are the easiest beings materialized as evidenced by the many reports of their appearance to more people in recent years. In fact, if the vibratory influence right 
for them is present, they can manifest without any human being present at all. This accounts for the many tracks being seen along the mountain ranges of the West Coast and Canada. I think Fred found something else up in them hills. Yeah, he's definitely on some wacky tobacco, if you ask me. Well, he might be on some peyote. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Is there this, a lot of peyote in Washington State? I don't know. If you get being led around by a Native American, I'm pretty sure that said Native American has some peyote. That's true. He is a spiritual Native American. I mean, we're in the spirit world. They, <laughs> can't, <laughs> they can't see us, Chavez. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> <Our> chickens. <laughs> oh, this is what Fred Beck believed kept the Sasquatch or Bigfoot creatures hidden or avoiding capture. Their ability to manifest into our world or dimension via vibrational frequencies of the spirit. The incident at Ape Canyon occurred in July of 1924. However, the story of the Native American spirit, arrow or interdimensional Sasquatch creatures, did not surface publicly until decades after their encounter. Not until Fred was 78 years old and had nothing to lose from it. It was. Wouldn't that be some shit, though? We finally catch a Sasquatch alive, got a live specimen, and then that motherfucker has the nerve to just dissipate into another dimension. Just blinks out inside the cage. I'm out of here. Son of a bitch. (laughs) It was something that Fred wanted to keep to himself on the count that it might sound more ridiculous than an ape-man story. But as the decades passed and the original members of the group also passed, Fred felt the need to confess his true experience up in Ape Canyon. Fred felt that in order to understand these creatures and what happened to the men up on Mount St. Helens, that the truth must be told no matter how crazy it sounded. Well, yeah, Fred, if you had started all this out, there was nobody going to believe you what happened. I mean, I'm kind of skeptical myself. <laughs> yeah, Fred, and it's been a lot of time since you let this one fly. Now, many officials stated that it had all been a hoax perpetrated by the prospectors themselves, either to keep people away from their mining sites or to make a little extra money selling it to the tabloids. The official investigation into the incident yielded no evidence of the eight men or a body. Besides the tracks that were photographed, nothing tangible was recovered. The game warden investigating the case labeled it nothing more than a clever hoax. Up to their deathbeds, the five men stuck to their story about their encounter in the mountains, never wavering from the details and descriptions of the alleged creatures that tormented them that July evening. Fred had always claimed to have a special gift and ability to tune in to other dimensions and higher states of consciousness. This is how, according to him, we are able to communicate with higher spirits and the creatures we call Bigfoot. Now, he would go on to point out that the fact that they would sometimes find just a single set of footprints on a sandbar with no others around that there was never any other physical trace was evidence that they could phase in and out of reality. He says to this quote, there is no doubt in my mind that these beings were present and observing us, but they had not yet appeared in physical form. There were, there we were standing in the middle of the sandbar and not one of us could conceive any earthly thing taking steps 160 feet long. No human being could have made these tracks, Hank said, and there's only one way they could be made. Something dropped from the sky and went back up. There was no third step. This is certainly another indication of what I'm saying about manifestation. I have heard it said that many ages ago, the Rocky Mountain and Cascade Mountain Ranges were a center of a great civilization. I do think that the mountain areas are extra sensitive to spiritual vibration, usually of a higher order, but sometimes of a lower order. We ourselves, being extra sensitive to spiritual vibration, probably had come into contact with the manifestation of these beings easier than perhaps the average person would have. In the true sense, everything in the material world is a manifestation. Ever since the time of the first essence of consciousness formed from the great void, We cannot describe different planes or dimensions of being were created or manifested. Occasionally, 
we of this dimension of space can be conscious of other beings of a different vibration and consciousness. And then he goes on to talk about the abominable snow ban again and the anthropoid ape and that the anthropoid ape and the abominable snowman is the missing link. But he closes with, to answer these questions will not be found in expeditions. It can only come by man knowing more about his true self and more about the universe in which he dwells. Science has reached near perfection in a material knowledge, but has reached the borderline through which no infinite intellect can pass. All life can be studied, but man will have to look into himself to tap a spiritual power and realize the spiritual laws and reason with a spiritual mind. Man will have to break the little material shell he has around himself, which says this far you can only go and there is nothing more. What is outside that shell is pure life and it's even above and of a higher order than material life, though material and spiritual life would work in harmony if we could just let it work. End quote. Uh, he said a lot in that paragraph. I just don't know if he said anything that made any sense. <laughs> no, man, it makes perfect sense. Well, you I understand. Open your mind. I understand what he's trying to say, but <laughs> and if he, I don't know. I think there's a way he could have probably said it that would have lent more credence to him being extra sensitive, but to compound his story of Ape Canyon and then with the giant floating white arrow leading them to a mind is it's a little far. Uh, I don't know, man. It seems perfectly reasonable to me. <laughs> it's like a typical Saturday, honestly. You and uh, Bobo out there smoking the, yeah. the wacky weed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the story of Ape canyon so now yeah. we get into our theories no 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 no. we're not done we're not done yet we'll do tail coach you didn't even mention the uh the disappearance the disappearance of what oh uh, yeah 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 yeah. i forgot all about yeah. that yeah you're right yeah. you're right you're right i know i'm right i'm the glue that holds this thing together you're right you're right what was that guy's name Jim Carter. Yeah, Jim Carter. August Go ahead. Something. He was on a ski trip. Him and two of yep. his friends were going up Mount St. Helens and they were going to ski down. And he was, uh, Jim was going to take pictures of the other two skiers coming by him. So he skied ahead of them. And um, the skiers come down and they think they're about to pass where Jim's at. And as they come up on the spot, they don't see Jim. And so they think, well, we'll just keep going. Maybe he went to the bottom of the hill. They get all the way to the bottom of the hill and young Jim is nowhere to be found. So they contact search and rescue and lead search and rescue up there. And if memory serves me correctly, three of the men searching, two of them were doctors, were they not? Yes, they were. Yes. And they find his ski tracks, and they see where he kind of stopped, but then he it looks as if he just bolted down the side of the mountain. Yeah, it said that he took chances that no skier of his caliber would ever take unless he was being pursued. Yeah, and they said he was jumping, you know, small crevasses, um, and they could see his tracks, and then all of a sudden, that disappeared too. And so, one of the doctors that was in that three-man team finally comes out later and says, you know, kind of cryptically that he believes that he was being chased by something large, even though they couldn't find any footprints, they get down into the bottom of the canyon. I think the day late, a day later, looking for any, you know, backpack, clothing, skis, poles, whatever. And he said, as he's working through the canyon, that if he's just out of sight of any other human, he gets this feeling that someone is watching him. And he relays to the person he's telling the story to 
that that is the same canyon where Fred supposedly shot that Bigfoot and it fell to its death. But again, he says that it's well known in that area that you just don't go up to Ape Canyon, even in the daylight. Oh, I'm certainly not going. I don't think I would go by plane, to be honest with you. So, yeah, there's a there's a semi-missing 411 in the area, and then you go back to 1924 and you have the attack at Ape Canyon. I think that... If semi-missing? You, that dude's gone. He ain't been seen in decades. Well, I said semi-411, you know, because it's the whole... I don't know how many of the criteria it would actually... Because is there any water around besides just a stream? Because it doesn't one of the criteria have to be a large body of water? And grant, no, not necessarily. Oh, uh, okay. But, well, it would be interesting to see how many of the criteria could be checked off. I'm sure there's granite fields. He was just out of sight, so that's two. He's never seen again. There's no trace of him. It's like he just vanished. You throw in the water. They didn't. There wasn't any boots found, so that's not a usual four one one. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and there's probably more stories about the area around Ape Canyon of uh, people disappearing or other sightings or strange noises. It's not a place I want to go camping, I can tell you that. No, I don't even want to go camping in like a campground, much less at Ape Canyon. Well, you know, supposedly a couple of weeks ago, there was a Sasquatch scene up there in that town between the two of us. On the banks of that river. Yeah, I heard about that. Maybe we should get boots on the ground. Nah. I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those guys at the Bigfoot Museum can come go down there and do it for us. You know, I tried to go to that Bigfoot Museum again the other day, but the person I was with told me to piss off. Oh, damn. They, they non-believer? No. Just lazy. Oh, uh, well, you know. You got to do what you got to do sometimes. I know. If you're in the uh, area, you should go through it. It's worth it. It's worth an extra it, 30 minutes. It's definitely worth it. I mean, the butt uh, cast by itself is worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think happened in Eight Canyon on the Fred and Hank story? Okay, I have little doubt that something attacked the cabin. I don't think five guys are just going to make that shit up for no reason. Uh, I think that Fred may have lost his mind in his elderly age and just decided to go full-on fucking crazy and embrace it. <laughs> Spiritual and all. Yeah, he's like, man, I know how to make sense of this. <laughs> he just wigged out right there. And I guess the 160 foot thing is, I kind of read a couple of articles. It sounds like from one side <clears throat> of the creek across the sandbar to the other side of the creek is 160 feet. So what they were trying to say was that basically it stepped off from one bank into the center of the sandbar and made two tracks and then stepped up on the other bank. But that's still, if the sandbar's, what, 30 feet across, you're still looking at, so that leaves you 130. So walk through the water. That's a 60-foot leap. Well, I think if you had to walk through the water, water not left any tracks. if it's a rocky bottom, you're right, it would have. But I'm just wondering with that sandbar, surely there's sand right there on the edge, but I don't know. But I'm with you, though. I think that they something did happen that night at the canyon, whether or not they shot and killed one, I, I don't think that would have happened. Now, if it did, there are rumors of Sasquatch burying their dead. So if it was one of many that day, they would have taken the body on. And, you know, he didn't go back for, what, a couple of weeks or months? I believe that's true. The many a many a rainstorm would have washed away any blood. So Well, and I mean... It's an animal out in the woods. It's going to get eaten. Yeah. Nobody's just going to leave meat laying around. True, true. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know no. I'm with you. I think the, the attack on the cabin happened. I don't know whether or not I believe the 
the shots being fired and striking. It's not too hard to see Bart fly off a tree, I don't think, at 100 yards. No. So that's not really – that's not a, a deal breaker for me. But I don't know, man. It's This is an odd one. Now, the skier, he's – that's extremely odd. And then for it to happen in the same place and then the guy searching for it to state that they felt like they were being watched anytime they were alone. Yeah. That also leads credence to that area is almost kind of a hotbed. Maybe we can get the old uh, Sasquatch hunters in there and spend the night. Maybe. Todd standing. Let's reach out. See if the buy a plane to you. Well, what are we going to do? Fly drones? Because I'm not sleeping out there. No, I'm just going to go. Oh, okay. And have them give me a report. You'll be, you'll be the base the camp. Yeah. Sheridan, you'll have your monitor set up at Sheridan monitoring everything. Yeah. They're going to have to meet me at the Sheridan bar <laughs> after hours and <laughs> we'll give discuss me an it. So we had a message from one of our patrons, uh, one of our new patrons, Dean Knighton. And he says, quote, I was curious, was you guys thought of the Todd Standing Bigfoot fitted, footage? Footage. I just was watching his Discovery Bigfoot documentary, and some of the footage looks too good to be true, and his reaction is way too nonchalant for me. What are y'all thought? What are y'all's thoughts? Um, and I stated he is so controversial that he could have actual he could have actual footage of a Sasquatch, or he could have an, a body, and no one would believe him. Dean is right. That footage is just man, it's it's so crystal clear. If it is truly real. That is the smoking gun. I, I mean, but you you can't take Todd standing at his word. That's the bad thing about it. People have well, the, had to distance the, themselves from him. The video itself looks like shit. I mean, the the creature in the in the video looks fake as fuck to me. Yeah, I mean it, but the detail that he went to about it is it's real detailed when it zooms in on that face. But yeah, I agree with you. Um, and then he's the only thing that only saving grace about Todd Standing is the fact that Jeff Meldrum associates with him. That's what I was going to bring up. But he also, Doctor Meldrum, kind of keeps him at arm's length too. He's he's very skeptical of anything that Todd brings him. And then you've got Survivor Man Les Stroud. He spent time with Todd up there, and. Now, Todd's got those videos of something whooping and hollering, and he goes out there and loses his mind around that campfire. But I just, I don't know, man. I don't either. What's funny is Dean didn't know that we were going to do this. He said, um, when I told him that he's so controversial, he said, that's a great point. There's two sides to the big Bigfoot believer's coin. Realistic people who recognize it for what it is, just an evolutionary anomaly that survived. And then the weirdos who think it has magical powers and such. The Sasquatch Chronicles podcast has some real level-headed conversations on it, and every episode features a few encounters and some audio here and there. It's a very good listen. And then he says, I listened to you guys the first half of my shift in Chronicles after lunch break. Well, Mr. Dean, we appreciate the listens, and we will definitely check out that podcast because if they are level-headed, I would love I, – I, I do like Sasquatch, Sasquatch. Sas Sasquatch or Sam Squanch stories, especially if they have, you know, recent sightings and stuff. And then but he's right though. I mean that when you get into the alien Bigfoot, uh the different plane it, I'm not saying that we won't ever find out that it, that might be true, but that's just hard for me to swallow. To yeah, be. it's it's it gets too far out there for me. Yeah. So Mr. Dean Nighton, we do appreciate your hard-earned cash and the conversations on Patreon, or Patreon, I should say. Well, recommendation times, Coach? Man, I recommend going to see the new Spider-Man movie. I watched it last night, and it's freaking amazing. I have heard that it is very good, but I also have heard that it is three hours long. It's two hours and 20 minutes. But the previews, yeah, there's like 30 minutes of previews. So, yeah, it's going to be a three-hour trip. It's worth it, though. Show up late for the previews. Show up late for the previews. Well, my recommendation is going to be 
the YouTube channel, and we've recommended them before, The Missing Enigma, and it's the disturbing disappearance of Joe Carter and the incident at Ape Canyon. They go over both of those. That's literally on my Research. TV screen paused right now. <laughs> but, yes, I recommend. You, I logged on 12 minutes and 21 seconds into it. And it's 13 minutes and 21 seconds. That's right. That's what I was about to say. So it's a quick video. Um, they do a m much better job illustrating the details. They always give you some good pictures and stuff about what is seen, but check them out. It really He's goes. He's got a great voice, man. He does. He does a great job with that disappearance of Joe Carter. So, but you got anything else there, Slappy? Man, you know I don't. Well, deuces. <laughs>